Good afternoon, and thank you for having me here at Percona Life. Uh, today, I'm going to be doing an overview of an awesome project called Trino, um, and uh, we're going to be discussing an exciting new table format called uh, Iceberg that optimizes uh, a pretty core use case of Trino. So uh, a lot of you may be uh, not knowing what Trino is, and so you may be aware of a project called Presto um, that can run federated queries across multiple data stores. Uh, we're going to dig a little bit into the history of this, uh, but in short, the Presto community has largely migrated to uh, this Trino project. So a quick intro of myself. Uh, I'm Brian Olson. I'm a developer advocate at Starburst, um, and as well as a Trino contributor. Um, I do a lot on the Elasticsearch uh, connector, and, and uh, now I'm more recently kind of getting involved in Iceberg. Um, so if you need to find me after the talk today, uh, I am on our Slack channel uh, for, for Trino, but I'm also on uh, Twitter uh, at Bits on Data Dev. Okay, so let's go hop right into the overview. Um, we're going to be jumping right into Trino. And uh, what's going to basically uh, be covered is we'll, we'll cover Trino and how it uses uh, the Hive connector and the Iceberg connector. And uh, these individual connectors ultimately are utilizing these, these table formats. And so uh, that kind of uh, motivates the, the whole reason why uh, we're having this conversation from a Trino perspective. Uh, but then we also want to talk a couple, uh, about a couple things that are confusing uh, within the recent rebranding of, of Trino from, uh, from Presto. Um, we're also going to then hit on the meat of the subject, which is the issues with the Hive table format and what drove us to kind of move on to uh, creating the Iceberg connector and using the Iceberg table format. So, uh, so look forward to that. Uh, let's talk about Trino a little bit. So Trino is a, a fast distributed SQL query engine. Um, it's designed to hand large data sets, uh, and this is in particular in the analytics use case. Uh, it's not particularly specialized at, at doing transactional processing like you would expect from a traditional database. Um, and so this is going to be uh, going over multiple nodes. So that's the distributed nature of Trino, is that we have multiple workers uh, that kind of uh, handle this work in parallel and ultimately pull from each individual data source. Now. Um, uh, Trino is not a, a database. Uh, the, the key word there, query engine, is going to be delineating it from uh, a particular database that, because we do not store data. We actually rely on data sources uh, that are already storing this data uh, to pull to basically hold the data. And then we speak the language of all these different data sources to uh, perform joins across them. So if you need to, though, ultimately do some sort of join across Mongo, say with Hive, then, um, you know, this is where Trino really shines. You, you can do these federated use cases where you, you run a query across Mongo and then join it with data that maybe resides inside of, uh, of your data lake. And so, um, so we're going to be really uh, focusing in on, uh, on Hive and Iceberg. Let's dive a little bit into uh, Hive in particular and talk about some of the uh, things that uh, Trino was initially created for. So back in the early big data days, HDFS uh, was open source uh, software that everybody was jumping onto, but uh, nobody really knew how to really use it super well and efficiently. And uh, you had to hire on people that knew how to use MapReduce and how to write the custom code for your uh, MapReduce operation just to be able to use your data. Uh, so what Hive did initially was create a SQL on Hadoop solution that uh, exposed a SQL-like syntax called HiveQL and ultimately mapped that SQL statement into a MapReduce operation. So this was definitely a step in the right direction. It got uh, companies into a, a, a bit of a, a better situation where they could actually query their data. But things were ridiculously slow and, and unnecessarily so. Uh, one anecdote from Facebook was uh, it was a good day for a data scientist to actually get six queries run in a single day. Uh, so this was definitely high in demand, like needed to be quick, needed to be fast, and uh, ultimately still needed to support something uh, as, uh, as ubiquitous as SQL. So Presto uh, came around about four years after uh, Hive was created, uh, and it uh, was also developed at Facebook by Martin Traverso, Dane Sundstrom, and uh, David Phillips. Um, and so they aimed to really solve for this slow querying uh, mechanism that, that existed in Hive at Facebook. 
So the the philosophies around uh, this, whenever uh, the founders put this together, was they they really believed in open source in terms of how to make a project successful. So it was so, so, so important that uh, they had feedback from a community that could basically tell them if, if uh, there were not, they were basically missing certain use cases or needed to grow in certain areas. And um, another piece is that, uh, that Presto just works. Um, this was inspired from uh, some of the earlier commercial products that uh, these three had worked on together, uh, particularly Neteza uh, was one of these big inspirations that you just plugged it in, everything worked, and uh, you didn't have to have a specialist to really understand the system to actually run it. Um, fast interactive analytics, that's, that is the core architectural decisions for Presto. Um, and then correct results, uh, that was actually something that didn't exist all the time in Hive. Um, standards based being like uh, making sure that instead of creating your own dialect of SQL, you actually follow ANSI SQL, uh, follow the standards around JDBC and don't kind of deviate outside of those or have any special rules that uh, need to get followed just to, just to use it the, your, your version of JDBC or your version of SQL. So around uh, 2018 and maybe even a little bit before that, uh, Facebook started to kind of uh, put a lot of constraints on on how uh, individuals would contribute in open source. And ultimately, they unilaterally made a decision to uh, put rules around committership that favored a lot of things for Facebook, uh, and particularly made it a Facebook-centric type project. So at that same time, Martin, Dane, and David left Facebook so that they could uh, create a branch uh, called Presto SQL. Um, and the cool news is that the community followed in uh, the kind of assumption that uh, Presto DB for, fa- for Facebook would just kind of uh, lie dormant or, or basically go away. Um, that didn't totally happen. Uh, what basically came about was uh, Facebook re- revised that rule, and uh, ultimately that that uh, there is uh, there is some activity still going on in the Presto project, but it is still largely a, a Facebook centric project, accomplishing what Facebook needs versus uh, the open source uh, community at large. So what happened was Presto DB was, uh, which is the Facebook version of Presto, got put under the Linux Foundation, and the Linux Foundation decided that they wanted to uh, go forward and uh, assert the trademark of Presto at that point. And so uh, Presto SQL, which is the banner that we had gone under uh, with Trino, was now uh, forced to rename, and and that is why we have this cute little bunny uh, that is named Commander Bun Bun, and why we have. Uh, the name Trino. We're dealing with the same software uh, that was uh, developed over the initial six years uh, and now has since then become uh, much more active than the original Presto project. Uh, Same people, same community, and just under the the shiny new name of Trino, uh, which is short for Neutrino. So the thing to point out here is that uh, although, you know, there's still some affiliation with Facebook, companies don't really ultimately run open source projects. It's actually the people uh, that are involved in those uh, those projects that uh, are are what drives it. And so you can see that is very relevant in the graph here where that shows the git commits um, of the Trino project over uh, the Presto project in the last uh, two years since the split has happened. So more details about that at uh, this link here if you're interested. Um, but let's go right, right ahead and, and jump right into uh, the uh, meat of the subject, which is talking uh, the Hive architecture and how Trino uses that and ultimately replace the runtime. So jumping fa- back real fast, uh, we want to look at the Hive architecture and kind of understand uh, how this is laid out. And uh, it's easy to kind of split the architecture into three distinct spaces, which is um, the runtime components, which are going to ultimately be doing what we had discussed before, where it's mapping these uh, these this Hive QL language syntax into a MapReduce uh, operation set of operations that are going to occur uh, within HDFS, um, and so. Uh, so that is uh, the query engine aspect of it, or the runtime aspect. You can also look at uh, another layer, which is called the file storage layer. This was originally kind of Hadoop HDFS, 
uh, but has more recently become more cloud S3 compatible storage like MinIO and, and AWS S3, uh, similar ones that exist for uh, Google and, and uh, uh, Azure as well. And so, um, so the file storage is ultimately uh, storing anything from like, you could think of like a CSV file or a, or a um, JSON file, um, but more likely uh, in this particular case is, you know, it's, it's better to be storing them in, in formats that are uh, these kind of binary columnar formats that are open uh, called like, uh, you know, two examples, Orc and Parquet, uh, as well as Avro. Um, that's another one, but uh, the Avro is not uh, columnar. Uh, so if you look at the, those two, though, the primary Orc and Parquet ones, uh, they are basically just binary blobs of files uh, that ultimately get stored on in this file storage. And so uh, the third component uh, called the Metastore is kind of the piece that uh, translates uh, the runtime, which is interacting with this kind of typical table uh, schema abstraction uh, that needs to basically see the data as these as these rows that have uh, particular types and uh, have all sorts of different metadata associated with them. For instance, you know how do you map from uh, this table into where the data is actually located on disk? Um, so the meta store is actually storing information about that. Now, what uh, what's interesting is that there's kind of a fourth hidden component and uh this was uh a component uh called a roughly called the hive specification um but the weird thing about the hive specification is it didn't actually exist um it existed in the minds of the people who wrote the code uh as well as those who had to reverse engineer it uh, to basically understand uh how everything was being used in hive it really wasn't documented very well or at all um and so this was another big issue that was kind of invisible to a lot, to, to many uh, kind of using Hive, is that there was a lot of issues in terms of how the data was modeled, and it wasn't very apparent uh, first going through it, uh, and eventually people just got used to a lot of the ways that things were modeled in Hive. And we're going to get into a lot of that in, in the later part of this uh, of this uh, uh, presentation, so don't worry, I'll, I'll go into more specifics and try not to be so vague. Um, uh, it'll make a lot more sense. But all that Trino was really doing at this point was it was just trying to fix the runtime issues b to begin with. So when you look at what Trino practically did is it replaced that runtime, but did not actually solve for uh, replacing this Hive specification. And so this is, uh, you know, really the difficulties of, of what we had run into many times is that although we had fixed for a lot of the speed issues in the engine itself, there were still many issues going kind of on how we were laying things out on disk and mapping it back to the runtime engine. So let's lay out a couple of these issues uh, that came with the Hive table format. You'd have the invisible specification, like I mentioned before. Um, column models were very static and, and very difficult in the DDL, and they ultimately bled out into uh, what you would need to know, uh, particularly when you're using partitions. Uh, and when you created some table, it would be difficult to actually uh, uh, insert that data correctly, making sure that you are uh, keeping adherence to the partition model or basically the partition column that's being used in that table. And you'll understand what that means here in a little bit. Um, schema evolution required an entire data migration. There was no way to do an in-place in uh, schema migration in the Hive table format. Uh, it just You basically just said, okay, well, it looks like we need to either uh, add um, if you, you can add, uh, definitely add certain, um, uh, columns and things like that in later versions of Hive, uh, which was around Hive 2.2.2, I believe, and, uh, and things like that. But then if you ever needed to change the partitions or you wanted to rename a column, uh, or even just change the, uh, the, uh, positions of columns, uh, this was not supported, uh, in, in Hive. Uh, and unfortunately was a, was a big problem for a lot of folks because as, uh, the data model would, my, would, uh, definitely change. Um, you would have to actually, uh, uh, do a migration anytime you wanted to change the schema, uh, or most of the times when you wanted to change the schema. Um, Hive table format was really not built with cloud in mind. Uh, they, they track a lot of, uh, of the, um, 
of the files instead of tracking uh sorry at the file level they would track directories uh because again this was initially written for a file system which was hdfs and uh they would basically be running these expensive list operations uh and, and already expensive a little bit in, in hdfs but even more so expensive whenever you're talking about object stores uh and not necessarily always going to be accurate and correct uh as object stores uh are also uh not uh, they don't have particular guarantees. They have uh, basically eventual consistency guarantees. So there was no transactional uh, dependency that you could uh, that you could uh, in- instill into Hive. It was actually depending on the file system uh, to be robust enough to actually uh, give you that level of at- atomicity. Um, data and metadata, uh, you know, w- with the way that the meta store is set up, uh, the data and metadata is not synchronized in many cases. So you could have cases where uh, data exists in the file storage, uh, and yet uh, it doesn't exist in the meta store, and vice versa. You could have something where uh, some some entries exist in the meta store, but then it had been deleted from the file storage. Um, and uh, uh, no concept of time traveling. We're going to cover that later. Uh, but if you did accidentally uh, put some maybe corrupted data, uh, you there's no way to really revert that back. Um, and and then finally, a more permanent version of time travel, which is uh, rolling the, the data back itself. So let's go jump right into like the column and partition models uh, issues in Hive. So let's say that you actually want to create a table that's partitioned uh, on a timestamp. Uh, and this could be like the event time uh, and you want to uh, uh, partition it by day. So you uh, you would create, maybe have a create table statement, something uh, along this. This would be an ideal hive uh, uh, statement that you would want to use. And uh, ultimately how this data would get laid out would be you would have uh, an events directory at the very top uh, that kind of contains all the data in the table. And then if you wanted to partition by uh, this time step field, um, you would uh, you would just say, okay, let's partition it by and then give it the uh, the value of the field, right? Um, and so uh, so what you would be going for is maybe bucketing uh, this data by day. So any data that comes in April uh, 1st, on 2021 would go into uh, this file directory. Any data coming in on the 2nd, so a- April 2nd or April 3rd, would go into this one. So April 2nd would go here, April 3rd would go underneath this directory. And this is, by the way, like a file uh, structure that would be in your actual file storage. And this is ultimately what, what Hive was was kind of aimed to do, is, is it would just you know basically make it to where if I wanted to only pull data from this uh, date, I would only scan this directory and I would skip all of the data that's sitting in the other directories. And so this would be a great time savings. And so partitioning was is definitely a good thing. Um, but one issue with Hive um, when you're when you're doing this, uh, they're very strict in terms of like the ordering uh, that you had to do uh, in your in your DDL and in your create table logic. So, or in, sorry, in your create table statement. Um, so. Uh, it, basically, if you try to run that statement that we had there before, it's first going to complain that the event time table is not at the end of the, um, it's basically not at the very last column. So this was very strict in terms of the ordering of, of your uh, table. You would always have to stick those, uh, um, this event time, move it down to the end of the, of the um, uh, basically the very last column of your table in order for this to actually work. Um, which it's, you know, you could say that's not really a huge deal. I mean, I'm not super concerned about the order as long as uh, that, that uh, timestamp field is still there. Let's go on to then the next issue. If we decided that we wanted to just move that event time uh, back, to the, uh, back to the end, well, okay, so this works. Um, but now uh, we have this other issue. There's no way really in Hive to, t- to say that this timestamp uh, is actually uh, going to be partitioned by day. Uh, Timestamps are actually, uh, by default, uh, going to give you down to the second uh, level of granularity when printing a uh, string value. So, um, so basically, what would happen is uh, you would have every event that came in. It would actually end up going into a partition, a, a directory that is uh, partitioned down to the second. So every second in the day of of April first 
uh, any any event that you get within that second is going to have its own directory, and this is going to explode the number of directories that you have and actually have very little data in each directory. So you don't really want this, and there's really not a clear way to do this in Hive without um, making a whole uh, duplicate. Actually, yeah, here's here's what your uh, your partition would look like. So you would have event time, uh, and they would have basically uh, for April 1st, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, That would be one directory. You got some events at that at the exact uh, uh, beginning of the day. And then at second one, you would then have another directory that gets created for the events that came in on the next second. And so for every number of seconds in the day, you would approximately have that many directories that get created depending on how many events you have coming in in the day. So the solution that Hive came up to to solve, you know, actually being able to uh, deal with granularity of day is that you would create a duplicate field. So we we want to still use event time, but you would just make a varchar field that would uh, give you uh, the ability to insert a string that would represent the day time uh, of that um, of of that uh, uh, timestamp. So this actually now uh, not only duplicates the field that you're dealing with, you want event time and it needs to get represented twice in Hive, um, but you actually are putting a lot of strain on the user of this uh, table. Anytime they insert data into this events table, they have to know that when they insert uh, uh, data for event time, they also have to insert a second entry for that same field and format it in the correct Format, the correct date format uh, that is used in that table. The same thing goes for the read, uh, and we'll get into that here in a second, is you'll also have to know to use this, uh, this field in order to actually take advantage of the partitioning uh, speedups. Otherwise, it's going to scan over all the data anyways. So that's fine. It works. Uh, this is how uh, it works in Hive. You know, you would actually then get, uh, instead of the event time field, you're actually getting this event time day uh, field that partitions based on these these uh, strings that you pulled from the timestamp. And so the insert statements would look something like this. You insert into hive.logging.events. Um, you have all the four original fields, but then you would have a, a, another field down here that uh, when you're inserting, you would have to make sure you got this uh, part here correct correctly. So, um, so this, uh, if you know, there's nothing in Hive that really validates that this field and this field are aligned. So if somebody were to make the accidental mistake of inserting the data and this was actually saying 4.1, but this said 4.2, nothing in Hive would stop you from actually inserting that incorrect data. And then this row here, if this was saying, you know, 4.1, that would get inserted into the April 1st bucket uh, or partition uh, rather than the um, the, the a April 2nd uh, partition and would not be returned if you um, if you were to be um, where you if you basically uh, uh, did the filter on that particular column so so this uh, if you look at the partition model here um, if you are basically look at the select statement if you were to run this select statement and you only did a um, did a filter on event time and you forgot to add event time day on the reading side, you end up scanning all of the data for ev every single date that you have in there anyways. Um, whereas if you, you know, you'd have to actually remember to add this predicate and event time day and basically repeat the exact same query or the exact same predicate that you had with event time. And they both return the same result, but ultimately this query down here would be the only one that takes advantage of your partition. So this is very tedious. This is very uh, time, t time painstaking issues that anybody using uh, Hive would have to. So moving on, you can see now that we were moved to the uh, iceberg catalog. When we do this uh, DDL statement or the create statement here for, for iceberg, instead, uh, we basically have just the original four and iceberg supports uh, specifying the granularity uh, on the actual partitioning spec. So this is instead of just specifying the the uh, the particular column that you're you're using, you also specify uh, the transformation that needs to happen on it, and that lives uh, together. And 
this is great because now when you actually insert the data, you're just going to insert the timestamp and you don't have to insert that separate field that has to stay aligned. Ultimately, what happens is internally, Iceberg will know to take this timestamp and apply the partition and do everything itself. So you don't have to, the, as the person that inserts the data, all you do is you insert this timestamp. You don't even know which, which field is actually being used for the partition. And so, uh, so you don't have to think about that. All you have to think about is, I just need to make sure that I'm pushing these original four fields that, that matter to me uh, as part of this data type. Uh, and then uh, Iceberg takes care of the rest. And then the same way on the read side, you only have to do the uh, the select all from Iceberg or event time less than this uh, timestamp. And that's actually going to still utilize the partition internally. It knows that this field is a partition field and that if it gets used in a where clause, it needs to actually utilize and check to see if there's a partition there that can be utilized. And so... Uh, so it it ultimately has uh, uh, creates internally this partition layout uh, using the event underscore time underscore day. But what's great is that you don't have to know about this as the person uh, inserting, writing to, or reading from this table now. So this is great, and uh, that's uh, you know one of the biggest headaches that um, that uh, you know Iceberg has taken off the plate just 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 for starters. Um, the next level is what if you wanted to change that partition? So in Hive, uh, from the beginning, if you, if you had some partition that you, uh, you, you created in a table, if you decided, you know, maybe a year down the line that that partition scheme, let's say you partitioned by month, uh, you started getting more data and you needed to partition at, at a more granular rate, uh, you couldn't really change that without having to do a full on migration. So it, it adds a lot of pressure to the developer who is, uh, or the engineer who is creating this table to decide what is the partition, correct partition granularity that we need to choose for this table. Otherwise I'm going to be doing this really painstaking, uh, migration of my data, uh, moving forward. And so, uh, becomes this really difficult choice to, to even start, uh, in creating your data. So, what if you could actually do both? What if you could actually, at some time down the road, uh, change the partition spec that you initially put from the beginning? So this is, uh, again, as you would expect, um, ice was what Iceberg supports. So you can actually uh, write data in uh, at, let's say, a month granularity. So uh, in here, it's basically showing uh, in 2008, uh, you know, you're, you're writing data uh, at, a, at a month. And then you're writing, uh, you know, everything in, within the same month uh, falls underneath the same directory. And then uh, right at the, you know, midnight on 2009, uh, January 1st, you move over to a day partition. And so uh, from that point on, then everything gets bucketed by day. Uh, you can run a query, you can write, for one, you can write uh, correctly uh, and uh, to a table in Iceberg and basically have this functionality work uh, that you're, you're basically bucketing it the correct way and updating the spec. But then the coolest part is that when running queries over two separate partition specs, uh, data that is you know, stored under two different partition specs, you're able to actually read uh, and 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 get the take advantage of whatever the partition spec was at this point uh, in the earlier time when you were just doing it by month, and then you were able to use the the uh, take advantage of the partition spec at uh, at this particular time uh, for days. So here it's you know doing the query uh, greater than uh, December fourteenth, and then uh, less than uh, the uh, January fourteenth, two thousand nine. And so you could see here, you will we'll basically be able to uh, do the granularity of a day uh, and actually an uh, get exactly the columns or basically the rows that will answer this query um, on, the, on the 2009 side. And then we're going to get a little bit extra on the days, on, on, the, on the bookings table time where we were partitioning by month. And that's just because we were only partitioning by month back here and we will we'll, uh, later on filter out uh, when we're actually looking at the date field um, and and filter that out manually, I guess. So 
So this is great uh, and uh, ultimately gives you that flexibility to change your partitioning scheme over time uh, and and still be able to, to read across those different uh, uh, partition schemas. Um, schema evolution, I, I did mention there was some limited support of, of doing this in Hive. And, uh, you know, depending on the file format, uh, you would have to actually look up and say, okay, uh, based on what's actually supported with this file uh, is what I'll actually be able to do. Renames overall were, were just never supported in Hive because anytime a, uh, a file, uh, let's say, that had a, a, a previous name, so let's say the previous name was Bob, and you rename from Bob to another name, uh, that might actually end up taking a, a name that had been used before. And the issue there is that if you rename from, let's say, Bob to Fred, and then you renamed another column from, let's say, you know, Bill to Bob, uh, then that uh, that's going to basically be reading over the old data that was initially called Bob. Um, and this is going to give you incorrect results. Uh, I don't know if that example was very clear, but basically you, you can recycle the, the old names on accident and there's no way for Hive to actually be able to decipher what the, that the old name is no longer uh, uh, the in use for older data. Um, so, so this is a, a particular issue uh, that, that Hive was never really able to solve. And uh, now t with uh, table evolution, uh, in-place table evolution, it's, uh, it's t totally possible in Iceberg to do this because Iceberg essentially assigns a, a unique identifier for a column uh, internally and does not, um, does not actually require uh, just the name to be the uh, sole identifier. So, uh, so basically, uh, you can run statements like uh, alter table. And so if we look at it, think of our old table events and we wanted to add a column severity, then uh, we can run a select statement and ultimately get back uh, the same data, data that we had written in there before with the insert statement. Uh, but now we just have a couple nulls for uh, the old, uh, um, the, the severity column that uh, didn't exist when these uh, rows were written. So let's insert a new uh, value into this event table. And we're going to actually insert a severity uh, value of one. And then we'll run the same select statement. And sure enough, you see uh, that the one value is in the severity spot. Now, if I want to actually do a rename of this, uh, we, we could rename it from severity to priority. We just decided to use a different nomenclature for uh, for what what the uh, the field means or something like that. There's a change in the business logic, so we change uh, and do a, an alter table rename column from severity to priority, and then do the same select statement. But now instead of uh, pulling out severity, we call it priority, and then we get the same values back. And finally, if you want to actually, you know, drop the, a column, uh, that's also fine too. And and this was an issue, you know, like in in file formats like CSV, um, and where you, you are solely, uh, concerned about the, or, or, uh, worried about the position of the field within the CSV file. Um, and for this reason, uh, let's say you have like a file, like, a let's say priority that gets, uh, dropped, uh, and that, that, uh, column sits in the middle of, uh, your CSV file, that's going to move the position of all the, all the, um, the columns that are to the right of that CSV file. And so all of those columns are going to get offset by one whenever you do that drop. So for that reason, uh, Iceberg actually only supports uh, the, the val uh, basically the file formats that can guarantee um, the, this, this, or that doesn't use this position based type of uh, uh, type of, uh, what am I trying to say here? Uh, the position-based type of uh, of writing. So, um, so basically, uh, when you uh, use Iceberg, you have to know that you'll only be able to use ORC, Avro, and Parquet as uh, as your actual data sources, and that and this is the reason why is because they have these uh, guarantees that they want to provide for schema evolution. Okay, so let's move on to cloud compatibility. Um, one of the big differences between Hive and Iceberg is the way that they are listing and particularly point to the files that are actually stored in file storage. So Hive actually only tracks 
uh, at files at a directory level. And what that means is that if you are looking for data that is sitting under a particular uh, a section, a particular table, um, you'll not only point at the table, but you'll point at the directories that are holding the, uh, partic- the, the files. And this is due to the fact that Hive was created uh, with HDFS in mind, where uh, it was a file system that particularly uh, supported the directory structure very well. However, object stores do not uh, necessarily natively support this d- directory structure, uh, or at least very well. And while you can have different paths that, that are uh, existing as part of the object store, you, you are not able to actually, um, uh, actually have it listed contiguously. Um, objects are stored as key values inside of these S3 uh, type of uh, file storages, and um, and so trying to make them act uh, as if they are under a, a single directory structure does, is only a logical uh, representation. It is not actually a physical representation of how the data li- is laid out versus how you would see it inside of a file system like HDFS. So the to actually list out the files um, at a, at a directory level like Hive does. Uh, under cloud storage, it is very expensive operation and it is done very frequently uh, whenever you're using Hive. So when you look at the, this is kind of a visual representation of what that might look like. So, you know, you have a partition here and a a partition here underneath some table in the meta store, and that's pointing to a list of files, right? Um, And if you were to try to basically map that with Hive uh, over here, you would basically be pointing this structure to um, a, uh, a, a structure that is, again, kind of faking out the, the path structure uh, and that, would, that doesn't actually exist inside of the, uh, inside of the uh, S3 data store. So uh, what Iceberg does, in contrary to that, is the metadata actually resides in the file storage with the actual data, um, and the metadata is actually just a pointer to a bunch of files. And ultimately, what happens is when Iceberg uh, is going to get the data, it makes no assumptions that it needs to list out files. In fact, it can actually, through uh, traversing this persistent uh, tree structure, it can actually find the exact files that it needs to answer a particular query. So this is a huge advantage over uh, a Hive, where it may be actually listing a path structure and, and unnecessarily listing you know, a, a huge amount of files, whereas uh, uh, that would not be the case in, in Iceberg. So uh, this is not only just a, a spa- space and performance savings, but this also becomes a, an issue uh, based on uh, that, that Iceberg addresses um, based on how uh, the uh, eventual consistency works uh, for object stores as well. So uh, let's look at the fact that uh, the concurrency model. So Iceberg actually maintains this linear model of, of changes uh, called snapshots. So a snapshot is literally just the, the pointing, the, the, the top level pointer uh, to a manifest list. This manifest list is actually ex- existing within the file storage itself. And all this manifest list does is uh, it's an Avril file that literally just has a list of uh, an, an array of, of values that points to other manifest files. And these are also Avril files that instead of pointing to other manifest files, they point to data files. So this is essentially the tree structure that I had mentioned before. But now with this tree structure, what's interesting is uh, if you have data, let's say in this snapshot zero here, that uh, that is pointing to these two manifest files, uh, and you go ahead and insert a second set of data, um, that you can take a basic uh, a second manifest list that points to the original two files that you were pointing to in snapshot zero, and snapshot one will now just include this third manifest file that points to a set of data files um, from an insert that you just uh, performed. Uh, and now that is the new view of your of your data at this snapshot in time. So every time uh, you do any type of operation in Iceberg, it's going to create one of these new 
persistent snapshot uh, tree structures. And uh, what's great is that it reuses the data that was uh, manifest files that were there before. So you're not having to basically copy the data every single time. And you're only adding uh, a view to uh, the data that just got added or deleted or, or, or what have you. So, uh, so this is really uh, good, not only for being able to kind of move back and forth between these snapshots, but since they are immutable, you actually, uh, provided you do uh, a, a uh, optimistic concurrency control over the writers, um, you can actually get serializable isolation guarantees by, by having this structure. Um, the analogy I like to, to use uh, in terms of how this this lock and swap is achieved is by saying uh, a Git workflow analogy. So if you think about uh, the current snapshot as your master branch, um, you basically uh, will have multiple uh, people, multiple uh, developers trying to commit to that branch. Um, whoever makes it to committing that branch, uh, up, uh, basically getting their pull request merged in sooner uh, will basically be the one that doesn't have to rewrite their uh, their commit to basically uh, merge in with with whatever the initial developer uh, uh, did to um, to get that to to, to get that uh, their their uh, changes uh, merged in. So it works very much like Git uh, in the sense where um, you know multiple writers will be trying to write and whoever gets it in first, um, does not have to update their code, but the person that goes after that, uh, any 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 writer that goes beyond that, will have to actually uh, merge in the code if there is any overlap uh, in the changes. And if there's no overlap, then you can certainly merge, uh, you know, or basically uh, uh, have the following snapshot uh, get adding. So, for instance, if you're adding files, you never have any conflict there because you're not updating any files that it currently exist. Um, so, so this is a very nice uh, concurrency model, and it gives us a couple extra benefits, like time travel. So, um, so time travel is a very neat concept uh, in Iceberg. You basically can uh, do a, a select statement that, let's say, pulls uh, the existing data. So there's three uh, rows, and uh, we have two errors and a warn. Um, and so if we look at the snapshot, uh, we have the initial snapshot that comes back. It has an ID. Uh, and then there's a, this is the root of the, all the snapshots, so there's no parent ID here. And uh, the initial thing was uh, a, an append operation. Um, so this was uh, basically just initially creating the table. And then we inserted those three rows, and this was the snapshot that resulted from that. And this parent ID is pointing back to the snapshot, snapshot ID of the first row. So this is that linear model I was telling you about where you can basically, um, you know, kind of like Git, keep going back to similar to like a commit ID. You can go back to a, a snapshot ID and move around in time. So, uh, so the way you check this table is you basically take whatever the initial table was, so iceberg.logging.events, and you would add uh, uh, the... Um, uh, parentheses around the events table, and then add the uh, uh, character, the sorry, the um, uh, dollar sign character, uh, and then put snapshots afterwards. And then that is going to actually get you the snapshots for that particular table. Now, let's go ahead and look at the snapshots. Uh, keep that up here. And uh, if we want to actually look at the the files that it's pointing to, remember I, I said that there are these Avro files uh, that are all ultimately giving us the list. We can actually look at uh, the manifest list um, that are are containing various file stats for all the data files underneath of it, and uh, it's also going to be um, uh, you know basically pointing you to the exact location of that file. So um, so this is great, and this is how that tree structure actually works. Now, if we go ahead and do an insert uh, into this uh, events table and we look at the snapshots table again, we'll notice a new snapshot comes up. So this is now uh, the latest snapshot. It points back to the second row. And, uh, and now when we you know, basically do a select from that table, we notice that the new row info, it is all good, uh, comes back. So uh, the way that you actually can do time traveling, if we wanted to go back in time and before we had actually inserted that row, you basically, instead of doing the dollar sign appended to the table, you append an at, uh, at symbol, and then you actually add the snapshot ID of uh, the 
version that you want to go back to, the snapshot version ID that you want to go back to. So you'll do select level message, iceberg logging, and then events at this particular snapshot. And you'll notice that it returns uh, of basically the, the, the rows without that new value that you had just inserted. Um, if you wanted to persist that change, there is a way that you can do a uh, rollback, uh, which basically brings you back to that snapshot uh, permanently. And so you basically specify the schema and you specify the uh, table uh, in this, in this, um, this is a function call in, in Trino, and you'll specify the ID. And now you'll actually roll back to that previous uh, um, snapshot in time. And if you actually do a select without um, specifying the at symbol, you're going to get the value without the info sign. Now you could also roll back forward. Uh, you don't lose that new that snapshot that you just rolled back from. Uh, so you can you can again time traveling. You can go you know back back in time and as well as back to the future. Uh, pun intended. And so, um, anyways, uh, the <clears throat> the uh, uh, cool part about this is that uh, you're no lo- you're not uh, you're able to kind of move around freely and um, and if you put in bad data, you can quickly move back and forth uh, as needed to get yourself to a better state. And finally, one of the biggest things that Iceberg offers that that really is just you know totally uh, aberrant from from Hive is uh, this specification. Um, I told you that it was it was totally invisible in Hive, and uh, it it uh, is one of those things that uh, if doesn't require. Uh, any particular implementation. So Iceberg has an implementation. They have a library that you can use today. But if you decided that the way that they accomplish that is not performant or doesn't meet your needs, you can actually write an Iceberg compliant uh, uh, engine that sits on top or a library that sits on top of Iceberg uh, and does everything that the current iceberg uh, thing does by following the specification. So the great part is the community is focused on the specification and not really focused on the exact implementation of their library. And this is very different from any of the other table formats that are out there. This this basically uh, puts more enthusiasm in the community as a whole to come up with better solutions and, and is more open to uh, suggesting different ways of, of doing things. And so uh, this is why one of the biggest promises that iceberg brings with it is that the specification is the is the primary part that the community is supporting um, as well as, as a very good library for, for most use cases um, and and that those parts are growing out as well um, as, as needed so anyways uh, um, I wanted to do a quick uh, mention about uh, the Trino community. If you uh, are interested in, in kind of learning more about this, definitely come join our Slack channel. Um, you can uh, find it at this URL at trino.io forward slash slack.html. Um, you can also come check us out on Community Broadcast. Uh, my, myself and uh, another uh, individual, Manfred Moser, uh, does uh, uh, broadcasts about talking about all sorts of cool things, Trino. Um, we also run virtual meetups monthly uh, at, in different time zones. So if you're in the Americas, EMEA, or APAC, we're, we're going to be uh, bringing uh, different meetups uh, in, in at your time. Uh, then we also, uh, if you want to contribute, um, obviously go to the Slack channel as well. But then uh, you can find out more about that um, under our development page. Uh, finding out the same thing, you know, we, what, we, what we have going on in the community uh, through our blog site, as well as uh, uh, learning how to contribute to our docs um, as a URL down there. So thank you very much for your time and, uh, and hearing me present today. Um, uh, we really uh, are excited about all the things that are coming down the pipeline for Trino, as well as uh, you know this Iceberg connector. It's going to be uh, a really big deal in terms of changing up how we were doing things with the Hive table format. Um, looking forward to uh, seeing you all uh, in the in the community, and uh, thank you, and uh, have a good rest of your day.